Some people are more comfortable with that these days, so... Um, <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out. It's nice to see so many of you here. I, I've got a very strange story to tell you this evening, and I'm, I'm always a bit embarrassed at the beginning of this story because it involves an act of vanity on my part, which I'm not exactly proud of. I'm not the only person who falls victim to it either. Most people in what we laughingly refer to as the entertainment industry fall prey to the same thing. Basically, as we grow older, we acquire the desire to be taken seriously. Happens at about the age of 30. All of a sudden, at the age of 30, every singer wants to be an actor, every actor wants to play Hamlet, and every comedian wants to write a novel. That's the way we're built. <laughs> I could see all this approaching on my horizon as my 30th birthday was approaching, except that on my 30th birthday, my so-called job took me all the way from London, England, to Aspen, Colorado, in the United States of America, and sat me in a theatre watching one of my childhood heroes, Steve Martin, performing a live routine about his singing testicles. <laughs> I thought to myself, fuck it, <laughs> this is brilliant, I carry on, so I did, I carried on being an idiot for another year of my life, and then a year later, on my 31st birthday, it hit me like a train, I woke up in the morning of my 31st birthday thinking I'm 31, I'm a grown up, I'm an adult, I want to write a novel, <laughs> so I rang my manager, Rob, that's Rob there. <laughs> That man is an idiot. <laughs> he took me seriously. That is no way to further my career, taking me seriously. That's what the idiot did. He said, I'll see what I can do. I'll set up some meetings for you. He rang me back a week later saying, I've set up a meeting with a man called Jake. That's Jake there. <laughs> Jake works in publishing. Jake works for Random House Publishing. That is the world's largest publishers. And that man is another idiot. <laughs> he also took the idea of me writing a novel seriously. I end up in a meeting with Rob and Jake, both taking the idea of me writing a novel seriously, which appealed to me. I was 31. I wanted to be taken seriously. That was good, it was nice, it was comfy. And Jake, very young but also very earnest, very keen that I understood exactly how hard it was to write a novel. He said to me, Dave, Dave, it's very hard work. It's just you, your imagination and a computer. Are you really sure you're going to put the hours in? And I said, yes, Jake. <laughs> I'm 31. <laughs> I'll tell you how serious I am. I am actually considering growing a beard. <laughs> and as I said that, I locked eyes on Jake, mainly because I didn't dare look at Rob. I knew what Rob was doing. Rob's eyes were burning into the side of my face, thinking, do not fuck up this meeting with your stupid beard talk, mister. <laughs> so I've locked onto Jake instead. He crumbled. He went, y y you've got a deal. And he took my hand, and there and then, on a handshake, in that office, the world's largest publisher gave me a deal to write a novel on condition that I grew a beard. <laughs> so, obviously, I went away and grew a beard, didn't I? If you don't believe me, there it is. There. <laughs> I don't know why I'm showing you that, because here it is. Here. And then things got even more stupid. The idiots gave me money. That's no way to get me working, giving me money. <laughs> You want me to work, you keep me hungry, that's how you do that. <laughs> the idiots went and put money in the pot. I have no idea how to explain to a collection of grown-ups such as yourself how I got given money for doing something before I'd done any of the doing of it. <laughs> the best I can think to explain it is to say that this man's stupid and this man's good, but anyway. <laughs> The upshot is, I'm there in my living room, 31 years of age, beard on my face, money in the bank, at the computer, trying to write a novel. Oh, it's hard work, really. <laughs> No idea. I've, I've never been the most motivated man in the world. I like doing things, I just don't like starting them. I'm not good at the beginning. But the biggest distraction of all was my computer. Jake lied to me. Jake said it's just you, your imagination and your computer. That's not strictly speaking true. My computer is attached to the internet. <laughs> the internet contains everything in the whole wide world ever. I don't know about you, but I sometimes find everything in the whole wide world ever to be a bit distracting. <laughs> I would sit there at the computer thinking, right, here we go, chapter one. Just as soon as I've checked my emails. <laughs> well, that's a day of my life right there, isn't it? I get more emails in a day than it is possible to read in a day. It's not just friends and family and colleagues that write to me. Complete strangers write to me by their hundreds every day of my life. That's what I was doing one day, kidding myself. This is some kind of preparation for writing a novel. I'm reading all of these emails. One of them catches my attention. I don't know who it was from. It was from a complete stranger. If I had to guess, I would tell you that I think he's Australian. I don't know that for a fact, obviously. People don't start emails by saying, hello, I am Australian, do they? <laughs> what he actually said was, g'day, Dave, oh, it's a good guess, I'll give me that. 
Good day, Davo. Did you know you're a Google Wack Steve? I thought, well, no, I don't. I don't know what a Google Wack is. And forgive me, but it does sound like some kind of weird Australian insult. <laughs> There's only one part of my anatomy. I can imagine the Australians calling a Google, and Steve-O appears to be accusing me of whacking mine. Well, <laughs> you can't write a novel under those circumstances, can you? It's not possible. I needed to know what a Google whack was. So I sat there, I wrote him an email saying, what the hell is a Google whack? And he wrote back explaining it to me. I'll do my best to explain it to you here and now. Basically, Google whacking is a game that people play using the search engine Google. If you get online and go to google.com, enter two words and press search, Google then goes off and looks at over three billion pages looking for your two words. It brings back every single one of those pages that contains not just one, but both of the words you told it to look for. Normally, any two words you put in, it's going to come back saying, here are 8,947 pages of information. If, however, it comes back saying here is the one and only one page, when only one out of over three billion pages contains both of your two words, that there is a Google Mac. Now, I'll give you an example to make it really clear. I'll use the one that Steve-O had found. When Steve-O said that I was a Google Mac, he didn't mean that my name, Dave Gorman, was one. He means that my website, davegorman.com, contained one. He'd gone to Google, he'd entered in the two words, Francophile and namesake. And if you do that, Google looks like that. And as you can see, that is just the one hit there. Results one to one of one. I'm not making that up. It's the real deal. Now, some people... They see that, they think it's much easier than it actually is. Some people fondly imagine you're meant to put the words in inverted commas. I don't know where that idea comes from. I said nothing of the sort. I said just put two words in. And if you were going to Google that properly, you should obey the rules. Rule number one, there is no punctuation. It is just the two words. That's what you're looking for. And as you can see, that is just the two words there. No cheating has occurred. <laughs> Rule number two, some people think you're allowed to make up new words or spell words incorrectly for the sake of it to make them rarer. You can't do that. The words have to exist already. They have to be in dictionary.com. That is the dictionary of choice for the Google Whackers of this world. On the blue bar there, you can see the two words are underlined. That's Google's way of telling you they're in the dictionary. If they're underlined, they're in the book. If they're not, they're not. It's as simple as that. Rule number three, the website that it finds can't be a word list of any kind. It's got to be a real website written by a real person with real words in context. So there you go. It's very simple. Two words, one hit, three rules. That's the rules of Google Whacking. Now you all know what a Google Whack is. And now you're probably sitting thinking, well, there you go, Dave. You've established it's not some weird Australian insult. There's nothing to stop you cracking on with chapter one of your novel, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Only it's not that simple, is it? If you find out what a Google Whack is and you're sitting at a computer when you find out what one is, <laughs> And you don't try to find one, you're not bloody human, surely. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, I'm good at this, surely I've got a head for this kind of thing. I like words, yeah. Kind of thing a novelist would do, isn't it? Think about words, yeah, I'll give that a go, yeah. Absolutely. I'll take me 20 minutes, I reckon. I wasted another day of my life. <laughs> I spent hours failing, hours and hours putting random pairs of words in. Four hours after I'd started, I was still going. Four pork turncoat, 381 hits. Why are there 381 pages with pork and turncoat? Dog. That's what I'd like to know. Porky turncoat, 43 hits. Dork turncoat, 78 hits. Dork turns bit. Oh, yes! I got one eventually, didn't I? Dork I did, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I found one. There it is for you there on Google. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that is quite an intimidating website to go and visit, yeah. <laughs> womenanddogsuk.co.uk You pause for breath before you click on a link like that, don't you? Really? <laughs> I live alone. I still checked over my shoulders before I clicked on that. I'm about to show you a photograph from womenanddogsuk.co.uk If you're worried about this, you think this might offend you, please look away now. I'm not showing it in order to cause offence. I'm showing it to you in order to demonstrate the nature of the Google Whack I found that day. It's not going to be on the screen for very long, and I will tell you when I'm taking it away. So, please, if you are worried, look away now. Here comes the photo. There you go. Um... <laughs> This was the first photograph I found. It was in a book, writes Marcus from Birmingham. How beautiful is this? I love shit like this. This is a man called Marcus who lives in Birmingham whose hobby is collecting second-hand photographs of women and dogs. <laughs> How beautiful is the world now that you know he exists? I love this. I looked at every single picture that man had to offer. I wasted another day of my life looking at this. How could you not when it's full of things like that, really? Her red shoes suggest that she is lively. Yes, of course. We know this to be true, surely. I love things like this. 
And at the end of the day, when I looked at every single picture this man had to offer, I thought, you know what? I'm missing a trick here, aren't I? When Steve-O found a Google Wack on my website, he sent me an email to tell me that I was a Google Wack. Presumably, that's how you're supposed to behave. Otherwise, you're Google Wacking behind someone's back. That can't be polite. So I sent an email to Marcus saying, hello, Marcus, did you know that you are a Google Wack? And he wrote back saying, what the hell is a Google Wack? <laughs> and so I wrote back explaining it to him, and he wrote back to me saying, that sounds a bit strange. Which is a bit fucking rich when you think that's his hobby. <laughs> but I liked him. He was a lovely man. We wrote to each other every day for months on end, sometimes three or four times a day. Went on for three or four months, this. And I'll tell you what, writing to him three or four times a day for three or four months is another great way of not writing a novel. <laughs> I kept trying to trick my head into new ways of thinking. I'd be sitting at home on a Sunday afternoon, observe a newspaper, pot of coffee on the go, thinking, I know, I know, I'll crack on with chapter one of this novel just as soon as I finish this crossword. That's what I'll do, yeah. I'll do a crossword, cryptic crossword, get my head thinking, start doing the observer cryptic crossword. Bit of a tricky bugger, I'm doing okay. It's cryptic, you know, they're hard. The words are weird, aren't they? I'm getting through them. Maybe seven or eight answers in the grid, answer number nine going in, and I find myself thinking, my... These words I've never met before. <laughs> There's no theme to this crossword. What I've got here is a random assortment of relatively obtuse words. Hey, that reminds me of that weird Google Wack thing I was thinking about six months ago, yeah. I reckon the recipe for a Google Wack is two unconnected but relatively obtuse words. Hey, hey, if my theory is correct, there should be a couple of Google Wacks hiding in this crossword. Hey. Hey, I tell you what, I'll crack on with chapter one of this novel just as soon as I finish this crossword and checked it out for Google Wax. That's what I'll do. <laughs> I finished it. I don't normally finish a cryptic. I must have been especially motivated by the whack factor. I went through it. I couldn't believe my eyes. Three down, 17 across, varsity's bonnets. That's a Google Wack, and there it is. 26 across and eight down, rare bit nutters. That's a Google Wack, and there it is. 23 across and 25 across, Termagant Holbein. That's a Google Wack, and there it is. I got three Google Wacks from one 26 solution crossword. I was delighted. <laughs> I had invented a Google Wack engine there. <laughs> All by myself. I'm in my own living room, feeling ever so strangely proud. <laughs> but alone. <laughs> I wanted to share my excitement, share my pride with them. I got my mobile phone, I started scrolling through the numbers, thinking, who amongst my friends is best placed to really understand this peculiar sensation of pride right now? Scrolling through, I see the name Danny, that's the man. You've got to know your friends well for this one, haven't you? Just as my thumb gets to the green button, my phone rings. Instead of making the call I'm trying to make, I end up taking a call and I've no idea who it's from. Well, who is it? What do you want? He said, it's Marcus, the woman and dog man. I haven't thought about Marcus for months on end, Google whacking for even longer, and yet the moment I Google whack, Marcus rings me up. It's like I've summoned the Google whack genie from nowhere. <laughs> well, what is it? What do you want? He said, I'm just letting you know I'm coming down to London in two weeks' time. I thought you might like to get together. OK, what do you want to do? He said, is there anywhere near you that we could buy some photographs? <laughs> I have no idea where you have to go to buy second-hand photographs of women and dogs, <laughs> nor do I fancy placing an advert. <laughs> but what the hell, we'll give it a go. So two weeks later, I, he meets me in London. I release him in Spitalfields Market in the East End, near where I live. He came away with four photos for his website. He was delighted. <laughs> and the strange thing is, so was I. <laughs> Every time a woman and a dog came out of there, go on, get in there. It was like four to me. I was excited. It was brilliant. Oh, at the end of that, four nil to me and Marcus. Come on, you man, I'm taking you out for Sunday lunch. You're coming with me. Down to my local pub we go. Nice Sunday roast, half a pint of beer. We're getting on famously now. Marcus says as much. He says, Dave, this is incredible. You and I are getting on incredibly well. And to think that we met, because of the most random thing in the world, a Google whack. How odd is that? I said, it's very odd indeed, Marcus. But isn't it beautiful in its own way? He said, I know, but think about it. These Google Maps must be almost impossible to find. I said, well... <laughs> they're not that hard, because I know I've invented the engine. He says, they must be. Google looks at over three billion pages. I said, I know, but maybe every one of those three billion pages contains a Google Maps. You don't know until you look, do you? Hey, I tell you what, if you want to, come back to my house now. I'll make the coffee. I'm only three minutes away. You can have a go on my computer. That's what we did. Took four minutes to get home, because on the way, I bought a newspaper, fancied a bit of showing off. Five <laughs> minutes later, he's at my computer, tip-tapping away, coffee by his side. I'm sitting in my armchair, three or four metres behind him, observe a newspaper, biro, crossword, thinking, 
fucking right. I'll show him some fucking Google whacking. Here we go. <laughs> Had you all been sitting in my living room that day, which would have been weird. <laughs> But had you been, you would have seen me, about 40 minutes later, leaping out of my armchair in full-on celebration mode. Real, go on, you beauty! I was a happy man. Nothing to do with the computer. I couldn't see the computer. That was Marcus's domain entirely. I was sitting three or four metres behind him. I'm looking at the crossword. I suddenly saw a detail on that crossword that I hadn't noticed when I first picked it up. The winners from two weeks earlier. And I'm one of them. I won the Observer Cryptic Crossword! <laughs> I don't normally win things in life. All of a sudden, I'm one of life's winners. Oh, I was delighted. I was so happy. One of the other contestants is a church from Southampton. <laughs> it actually does say on the page, well, the winners all receive the new Penguin English Dictionary worth £15.99. Nothing to get too excited about, nearly £16 worth of dictionary. That wasn't what got me excited, was it? No, no, no. It was the fact that I was a winner. Now, had you all been in my living room that day spectating, at the exact same split second that you would have seen me leaping out of my chair in full-on celebration mode, you would have seen Marcus leaping out of his chair in a celebration of equal magnitude. So I turned to him, what is it? What are you talking about? He said, I've done it. I've got myself a Google whack, and he had the lucky bugger. Unconstructed super egos. Didn't take him long at all, did it? Oh, no, and there it is for you there on Google, and there's the website it leads to there. I saw that. It was like I'd seen a ghost. I'd been to that website before. That doesn't make sense. This is a one in three billion chance. Marcus is a one in three billion chance. He's sitting in my living room taking another one in three billion chance. That shouldn't land in familiar territory. That should be in the realm of the unknown. I didn't know why I'd been there, when I'd been there, how I'd been there. I just knew that I had. I started scouring that page, looking for the detail that would trigger the memory. And when I saw what it was, I could not believe what I was looking at. Copyright David Gorman! What are the chances of that actually happening? That makes no sense whatsoever! <laughs> and let me explain something here, let me get confused. That's got nothing to do with me. That is not saying copyright me. It is saying copyright somebody else entirely, but who happens to share my name. <laughs> but as it happens, it is somebody that I already know. <laughs> There's a picture of him in his own website there. There's another picture of him from about four years ago, and there's me meeting him there. What are the own chances of that actually happening? That is ridiculous. And I feel I should explain something here, because I, I don't expect anyone to be familiar with my background, so let me explain. About four years ago, I travelled all over the world meeting other people called David Gorman, because my flatmate at the time, Danny, bet me I couldn't meet loads of them. <laughs> I won that bet. I met loads of them. It was a ridiculous... Now, as it happens, me and this particular David Gorman, the one whose website we've just found, we've stayed in touch. We're quite good friends. He's a lovely fellow. He lives in the south of France. He's actually Canadian, but his girlfriend's French, and that's where they live. Obviously, when I discovered his website, again, in this most peculiar fashion, I gave him a ring. I said, you're not going to believe what's just happened. And he said, what? And I told him, and he said, I don't believe you. I said, I told you you wouldn't. He said, you're right, you did. <laughs> And then he said the one thing he always says, whenever we chat, correspond, meet, whatever, there's always one thing that comes up in the conversation. He says to me, why don't you come over and stay with us sometime? It'd be nice to have you around the place. I said, Dave, I'd, I'd love to, I really would. I can't right now, I'm, I'm really busy. I'm, I'm writing a novel and... <laughs> I'll be honest with you, Dave, I haven't actually started writing any of the words yet and I, I really feel that the words is the area I want to focus on next as, <laughs> as far as the writing goes. And I'll be fair with you, Dave, I can't even afford it. I, I've got some money in the bank, but it's not really my money at the moment. It's, it's an advance from the publishers for the novel. Until I've written some of the words to earn some of those pounds, I don't think it's really morally fair for me to go spending that cash. I can't do it, Dave. I'm sorry. He went, look, it's the age of the budget airline. They're all over the shop. You can get a cheap flight. You can afford it on your own steam. Come out for a couple of days in France, blow the cobwebs out your head. It might help you start writing. Ah. <laughs> Makes sense, I'll give it a go, I'll see what I can do. I got online the next day, went to see what the budget airlines could do. Ryanair.com, cheapest fare from London to Nîmes, 0.01 Great British Pound! One fucking penny <laughs> to fly to France and another penny to fly back again! <laughs> On a plane of all things, how do they do that? I said, yes, before the computer decided it was clearly making some kind of mistake. <laughs> I ran David, immediately said, I'm coming out in two weeks' time. I nearly told her I'm coming out every week for that kind of money, I'll tell you. <laughs> And that's what I did. I flew to France, if you don't believe me. There's my boarding card, and there I am in France with David by the side of the pool having a lovely time. Now, what's happened at this stage of the game is I've contacted five different Google Wacks. Of the five that I've contacted, two of them have returned my contact and have ended up meeting them both. 
In meeting them both, I've travelled 1,064 miles, giving us, I'm sure you're all aware, 532 miles per Google Whack. Now, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I'm looking at you now, I can see the same question floating around in all of your eyes. You're all looking at me now with that little curious Swansea expression. You're thinking, Dave, what's that done to the graph? Well, <laughs> I... I... I, on the other hand, find myself looking straight back at you, thinking, what graph? <laughs> Why would there be a graph for that kind of information? Why would you all get together and expect a stranger to walk on stage in Swansea this evening and give you trivial details from his past in graphful? <laughs> How would that help us understand this story anymore? Did any of us know more about this story because that graph was there? This makes no sense at all. I don't want to be cruel to you. You seem like a nice bunch of people. <laughs> but that is a little bit sad. <laughs> You don't need a graph. It doesn't help us in any way. We don't know more about the story. There is no graph. You don't need a graph. There is no graph. <laughs> you don't need a sodding graph. You don't need one. You need a pie chart for that kind of thing. <laughs>I'm in France, I'm in David's living room, and I'm running him through these charts. And uh, <laughs> he says to me, he says, Dave, this is fascinating. I said, is it? He said, think about it. I am number two in a chain. I said, are you? What do you mean? He said, well, you didn't think of my Google, did you? Your imagination conjured up the words dork and turnspit. His imagination conjured up unconstructive superegos. I am number two in a chain. I said, so are you, are yes, so you are, yes. Very good, lovely diagram, well done, yes. <laughs> I see. He said, well, isn't that interesting, Dave? I mean, every step you take down that chain takes you one step further from your own imagination. You're right. Yes, you're a bit of a hippie, but you're right. <laughs> he said, well, how far from your own imagination do you think you could travel, Dave? I said, what do you mean? He said, how many links in the chain could there be? I said, what do you mean? He said, come on, Dave. I'll bet you couldn't get ten in a row. <laughs> You idiot! Of course you could! I've just shown you the mathematics, haven't I? One in four people is going to say yes. Every time you find a Google Whack, you persuade him to find four more. One of those will say yes, persuade him to find four more. One of those will say yes, persuade him to find four more. One of those will say yes, persuade him to find four more, and so on. You all get ten in a row, no trouble at all. It's mathematically likely. He went, yeah, that's if everyone finds you four, isn't it? Not everyone's going to be able to. Not everyone's going to want to, Dave, no. Everyone should only be able to find you two. Hey, 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 if everyone could only find you two Google Whacks, I bet you couldn't get ten in a row then, could you? I said, Dave, you're clearly not a mathematician. You're not thinking this through. It's an infinite task. It goes on forever. If you gave me a coin now and said, I bet you can't toss ten heads in a row, and I tossed that coin ten billion times, somewhere in that ten billion long sequence there would be ten heads in a row, and if there weren't, I'd just keep tossing until there were. It goes on forever. You'll always succeed. He went, yeah, but now you are assuming that life is in some way infinite. <laughs> Which it's not. No, no, no. What you need is some kind of deadline. What do you mean, what I need? <laughs> I'm talking about an abstract mathematical problem here. You're talking like I'm actually going to fucking do this. <laughs> he said, but you do things like this. <laughs> I do not do things like this. I've done one thing a bit like this once. That was years ago now, four years ago. Just because that's how you and I met, you can't go assuming I do things like this. You've met me nine or ten times in the last four years. Was I doing something like that then? I think you'll find I wasn't. I'm a grown-up now, Dave. I was an idiot child when you first met me. I was in my 20s. I don't know if you've noticed anything about me, Dave. I don't know if you've noticed anything different around here. <laughs> but I'll have you know I am a 31-year-old man. But hey, let me stop you right there. I'm your friend, Dave. And I love you, <laughs> but I'm older than you, and I've got some advice for you from an older man. 31 is not the age to go growing up. 32. <laughs> I said, no, he said, all I'm saying is, I bet you can't get 10 Google Whacks in a row before your 32nd birthday. If everyone knew me, he's only have to find you two more Google Whacks. And I said, no, I'm not doing this. Please listen to me. You know I don't want to do this. I'm here for a weekend in France with you and Alain. I love you too, Dave. I'm not going to fight with you. 
But at the end of this weekend, I'm going home to England, I'm having a nice, quiet family Christmas with my mum, and then I'm going to crack on with chapter one of my novel. OK? OK, let's not fight. Bottle of red, everyone's happy, nice evening. In the morning, I wake up, I wander through the kitchen, no hangover, very good wine. In the kitchen, Dave is already there preparing breakfast. He's a wonderful host. He says to me, Dave, I should have said this to you yesterday, I'm so sorry, I know what it's like to travel, I'm away from home a lot myself. You need to check your emails, anything like that. There's a computer in the study, it's online always, just go in there and help yourself. Actually, I get a lot of emails. Do you mind if I do? I, I, if I don't, I'm going to go home and have like a thousand waiting for me. I, I'll just be 20 minutes. I'll chip away at it. Into his study, I go tip tapping away on his keyboard. He comes in two minutes later. Cup of coffee for you there, David Gorman? Thank you very much, David Gorman. It still makes us chuckle. We're very childish. <laughs> Off he goes. <laughs> He comes back in two minutes later, this time, Pano Chocola. Here you are, David Gorman, Pano Chocola for you there, David Gorman. Thank you very much, David Gorman. Even the two-minute gap we gave it doesn't diminish the chuckle. We're very, very childish. <laughs> off he goes, he comes back in two minutes later, this time, piece of paper torn off the back of an envelope. Here you are, David Gorman. A couple of people I think you might want to be emailing while you're online. I look at this piece of paper, two email addresses belonging to complete strangers. Why would I want to email two complete strangers? Am I not making myself clear? These are the two Google Wacks I found. I didn't ask you to find me any Google Wacks. Why have you found me two Google Wacks? He said, they're number three in the chain. I said, I'm not on a chain. You invented the chain. You got on the chain and do it yourself. If that's how you feel about it, go on. He said, go on. I got up early for these. I worked hard for these. I thought they might whet your appetite. Go on. <laughs> have a look. See if you're tempted. All right, I'll have a look. I'll show you how not tempted I am. Go on, do your best. What have you got? Show me what you've found. He was very pleased with himself. He'd found unicyclist periscopes, and there it is for you there. And Dauphin Gorman dies, and boy, was he proud of Dauphin Gorman. <laughs> Come on, Dave. This is the Google Wack closest to our name. Come on. No, 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 no. You're not getting into my head that way. Absolutely not. I looked them both up for him. Obviously, Dauphin Gormandise belongs to a history professor from a Jesuit university in New York City. The other one, Unicyclist Periscopes, belongs to an organization called the American Physical Society. They represent the interests of American physicists that are based in Washington, D.C. I'm looking at these things saying to David, look, I'm not going to get on a plane and go to New York or Washington because you want me to. That would be the actions of a lunatic. Now, come on, I explained it all to you last night when we're drunk. I'll do it again now while we're sober if I have to. I'm not doing this. You know what's going on in my life. You know I've got this contract. You know I want to do this. If you encourage me to do anything other than write that novel, I consider that an unfriendly gesture. I mean, oh, all right, then. You're right. You are growing up. Looking forward to reading your novel. It's testing you. I'll tell you what, at least send them an email, eh? Tell them they're a Google Wack, yeah? <laughs> Be honest, you like knowing you're a Google Wack. I like knowing I'm a Google Wack. Go on, give them the good news. <laughs> All right, then I will. <laughs> Hello, American Physical Society. Did you know that you're a Google Wack, Dave Sand? Hello, American History Professor. Did you know that you're a Google Wack, Dave Sand? Sent these two emails off. Dauphin Gormandise, the one in New York City, that bounced straight back to me an error message saying this address no longer exists. But the other one, Unicyclist Periscopes, the American Physical Society in Washington, D.C., they wrote back to me. A man called David Harris wrote back going, are we really a Google Wack? Oh, I've heard of Google Wacks. They're fascinating, aren't they? We probably wrote about six or seven emails apiece that day between France and Washington. But at the end of that, I go back to plan A. I fly home to England, have a nice, quiet family Christmas with my mum, at the end of which I find myself thinking, it's time for me to crack on <laughs> with chapter one <laughs> of my novel. <laughs> Probably best to get New Year's Eve out of the way first, though, isn't it? Really, New Year, it hangs over you. It's a big one. It needs respect. You should do it properly, shouldn't you, really? I know. New Year's resolution, write a novel, easily solved. There we go. Into the car, down to London I go. Nice party. Me and 20 friends, we're in Soho. Champagne is flowing. We're singing and laughing and dancing and chatting and having a wonderful time. We're moving from venue to venue, and as we do, we lose a few people along the way. About five in the morning, there's still ten of us left. Two taxis, back to my house, open some more booze, the party continues. They're all telling stories and trying to be the one who tells the most impressive story of the day. Everyone's very polite, they give you the floor, you tell your tale. The minute you finish telling your story, somebody always, but always, leaps in with a, that reminds me! And they go higher and further and, most importantly, louder than the last person. One of my friends, lovely chap, lives in south-east London. He'd been on holiday to Spain that year. He told us all a story from his Spanish holiday. Walking up an Andalusian mountain in Spain, he bumped into his next-door neighbour from London walking down that self-same mountain. He told that story to the group and finished it going, Isn't that the most amazing coincidence ever? <laughs> and I said, No! <laughs> it is not the most amazing coincidence ever, this! 
It's the most amazing coincidence ever. And I proceeded to tell my living room the story I've already told you this evening about me in that living room with a one in three billion chance who takes another one in three billion chance and lands with someone I know and who shares my name and who happens to live in France. And the whole room said, that is the most amazing coincidence ever. And I said, yes, I know. <laughs> and they said, what happened then? I said, well, I went to France. Really, what happened then? Well, I stayed with Dave Nolan. then. Really, what happened then? Well, he said this, so I said this, and she said that, so he said this, and I said the other, and he said this, and she said that, and I said this, and he said this, and she said this, and I said that, and he said this, so I said that, and she said this, and he said that. But I said, this is amazing. When are you going to go to Washington? <laughs> I'm not going to go to Washington. I've just told you the whole story, including the bit about me not going to Washington. Why didn't you listen to that bit? And they said, but we're your friends. We bet you can't get ten in a row as well. <laughs> and I said, no. I am a grown-up. I am an adult. I am a 31-year-old man with a beard on my face and a contract to write a novel. I am an adult. So why the hell am I having a temper tantrum in my own house on New Year's Eve? <laughs> and they said, ooh. Touchy. <laughs> and one of my friends leapt in and went, stop this. We are friends. We're in the company of people we love. We're having a party to celebrate the New Year. We have no right to force one of our number to do something he does not wish to do. We should be encouraging each other in our own endeavours. Now, please, let's remember that we love each other. Let's remember this is a party. Let's have another drink together and put this kind of nonsense behind us. And he reached into my kitchen and pulled down my emergency bottle of tequila. <laughs> At which point, I find it rather difficult to tell you what happened to me on New Year's Eve. <laughs> the best I can offer you is some kind of dramatic reconstruction of events as follows. <laughs> That's all that I know happened on New Year's Eve. New Year's Day, I remember very clearly. I woke up on New Year's Day 2003 with a horrible, horrible, horrible hangover. I'm sure many of you have woken up on many a New Year's Day with a horrible, horrible, horrible hangover. I promise you that mine was worse. <laughs> I was woken up on New Year's Day 2003 by a young Chinese boy. <laughs> I don't live with any young Chinese boys. <laughs> I knew that something was wrong immediately. Took me a couple. He walked away from me, revealing a little news agent in the distance. There isn't one of those in my house either. <laughs> I knew that something was very, very, very wrong immediately. Took me a couple of seconds for the scales to fall from my eyes and everything to snap into focus, and I suddenly realised where I was. I woke up New Year's Day 2003 in Heathrow fucking airport! <laughs> A hot flush of anger and panic went right through me. Why am I here? What have I done? What's happened to me? What have I... Oh, wallet. Yes, I've got my wallet. Life's okay. And phone. Wallet and phone. I've got my life. I'll get home. It's okay. Good, 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 good. I swear on my life, this is true. I woke up New Year's Day 2003 with a ticket to Washington, D.C. paid for on my own fucking credit card in my pocket. I went straight to my ticket desk going, you can't sell that to me. That is illegal selling that to me. I was extremely drunk when you sold that to me. I demand my money back. It is against the law selling airline tickets to drunk people. Apparently, it's not. <laughs> they can do what they want, including not giving me a refund. You can't have your money back now, Mr. Gorman. It's the day of the flight, Mr. Gorman. It's too late for that, Mr. Gorman. I thought you'd know that, Mr. Gorman. There's two things you can do with that ticket, Mr. Gorman. You can go to Washington, D.C. with it or stay in London and look at it. I'm looking at that ticket. That cost a lot of money, that did. That goes to Washington, D.C. and comes back again a week later. That's a holiday, that is. You can't just put a holiday in the bin, can you? There are people starving in Africa. They'd love a holiday. <laughs> I'm looking at that. I found myself thinking, I know, I know. Best thing to do with a holiday you don't want. Start chuffing wanting it. That's the best thing to do with a holiday you don't want. I went straight to my ticket desk. You can't write. I'm going to go on holiday. I'm going to go on holiday, aren't I? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come back with a smile on my face. You wouldn't know what that's like, would you, Mrs. Ticket Desk? I'm going to have a holiday. I'm going to go to Washington. So I did. I flew to Washington, if you don't believe me. There I am, in Washington. <laughs> I got in a taxi. The nearest taxi said, take me to a hotel. Any hotel, please. I'm on holiday, apparently. I want to see the sights. He took me to this miserable little place. Nothing was open that day. Nothing was going on. It was late at night and it was New Year's Day. I needed things. I needed, I needed a change of clothes. I've been wearing the same clothes since last year. <laughs> nothing was open, nothing was available, nothing. I needed something to eat. Nothing was available, no restaurants were open, not even room service in the hotel. I was going mad. Eventually, I went for a walk. About 30 minutes from the hotel, I found a 24-hour garage. I bought the only things that were left on their shelves that I could afford, understand and consume. <laughs> I promise you this is the truth and this is a genuinely low ebb in my life. 
I ended New Year's Day 2003 naked in a hotel room in Washington, D.C., eating a pot noodle with a toothbrush. <laughs> that is not the start of my dream holiday. That is a nightmare brought to life for you there and then. And I apologise here and now for the image that is currently floating through your mind. But it didn't happen to you, did it? It happened to me. I got up the next day, I went to look at the statues and the monuments that this city holds. Oh, my life. If you're from Washington, I apologise. I know it's unlikely, but you might be. If you are, I apologise. It was the ugliest, rudest, dirtiest, smelliest, most rat-infested, litter-strewn, impolite hole I have ever had the misfortune to visit. No one was nice in that city. Not one person in Washington, D.C. that day said, hello, goodbye, please, thank you. Not even have a nice day to me in shops and cafes. I was going mad. I need other people. I feast on other people. Without other people, life is insufferable to me. I I couldn't cope with this. I knew the nearest I came to making a friend in Washington that day was when one man tried to mug me <laughs> twice. <laughs> With a 20-minute interval, I was going mad. I need other people. If only I knew somebody somewhere in this godforsaken hole of a city. And then I realised I sort of do. David Harris. Unicyclist Periscopes, Washington, D.C. He's here, isn't he? We wrote all those emails to each other when I was in France, yeah. That's friendship, isn't it? Six or seven emails. It's got to be, yeah, surely. It's got to do the job. It's the nearest thing I've got for thousands of miles, isn't it? I got into the hotel business centre, got onto their computer, found the website again, found his email address again, sent him another email saying, look, you might not remember this, but late last year I sent you an email to tell you that you are a Google whack. I don't want you to feel guilty, but you are the reason I'm now having a miserable time in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I'm here for a week. If at any time during that week you've got an hour to spare, you want to have a meal or a drink, it is my treat in return for you showing me that human kindness. If you think I'm taking the piss, I apologise, please ignore me. If you think I'm intruding on your life, I apologise, please ignore me. The truth is, I'm lonely. <laughs> this is my number at the hotel, this is my email address, and I'll leave the rest to you. Dave Send. God love him. He rang me at the hotel 20 minutes later saying, look, I don't start work for another day. How about tomorrow morning I'll come by, pick you up and go and have breakfast? Yes! I bit his hand off. What a lovely, gorgeous, welcoming thing to do. We did, if you don't believe me, there we are. Incidentally, that's not an overkeen waitress, that's his wife, Danielle. <laughs> now, David and Danielle, it turns out, are Australian. They loved meeting me because I'm not American either. <laughs> Almost the first thing they said, she went, Danielle, she went, you're all right. You don't like Washington, you're only here for a week. We've got to fucking live here. <laughs> Breakfast flew by. All we did was trash Washington for the ugly, rude, despicable, rat-infested, litter-strewn hole that it, it was wonderful. Got it all out of our systems. All of a sudden, Danielle stands up again. I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm running late. I didn't realise I've not been watching the time. It's flown, hasn't it? I've got to run, Dave. I've got a pottery lesson to go to. I'm not being rude. I've got to go. I'm sorry. Look, if you're still around in a couple of hours, why don't we all have lunch together? Oh. I love these people. Breakfast starts at 9.30. At 11.30, they're planning lunch in two hours. I'll have a day like that with any tosser any time, absolutely. <laughs> Off she goes to a pottery lesson. Myself and her husband, David, potter around the city, go and see some more statues and monuments and the like, and then we all meet up in this restaurant later. Danielle comes in maybe two minutes after myself and David. First thing she does, she comes up to me going, I got you a present. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love you. You only met me this morning, you've got me a present. Ooh. Then she showed it to me. <laughs> it's an ugly little piece of shit. <laughs> I don't rightly know what animal that's supposed to be, really. I mean, your first guess would you'd say was a bird. I mean, it's got a beak there, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But oh no, no wings, not even pretend sewn on wings, you might expect. No, no, no. It's only got two limbs, two little feet at the back there. If that was a living creature, that couldn't propel itself on land, air, or water. So could it? That's going to fall flat on its face, whatever it tries to do. Probably explains the rather pinched and ugly I fell on my face expression they've given it there. Blue Christmas hat, wrong colour for the garment, say I. That is an ugly little piece of shit. All of a sudden, I'm thrust into that rather awkward, difficult social situation where I've got to try and appear grateful for something, even though I clearly can't muster any genuine gratitude. <laughs> that absolute, isn't that? <laughs> that is just the most... And I look up and I can see a little glint in her eye and a little smirk in her smile. I thought, she knows this is shit. <laughs> I'm being tested here. This is a question of whether or not I am brave enough to acknowledge that I think it's shit, given that these are my only two friends in the whole of this godforsaken city. And after a while, I thought, I've got no choice. I'm going to have to go for this. I'm sorry, Danielle. This is shit. <laughs> she went, I know it is, isn't it? Look at that. It is shit. 
I said, why did you get it for me then? She said, take a look at the label. So I did. It's a teeny Christmas Google. <laughs> she said, I couldn't believe it. I was walking away from my pottery lesson towards this restaurant. I was running late. I didn't want anything. I've never been in this shop before. And for some reason, I stepped into a shop. I looked to my left. I saw a whole shelf of these. I thought, my, they're remarkably ugly pieces of shit. <laughs> I picked one up, I thought, what are you doing? And then I saw the label. I thought, this is amazing. You came into our lives this morning because of Google, and there I am, randomly holding a Google. How could I not get this for you? It's a sign from above, surely. And she's right, I'd have bought this for me as well under the same circumstances. <laughs> but crucially, this is the moment the conversation turned. All morning, all we talked about was Washington and how horrible we all thought it was. Now we start talking about Google, and therefore Google whacking. And her husband, David, the physicist, his, his brain clicks back into physicist gear. He's off again. Yes, I've been thinking about this Google whacking, Dave, ever since you first got in touch. Yes, I've got an idea about how to find them, actually, yeah. Hey, hey, I did you know set theory, Dave? You don't. Let's have another coffee, I'll explain it. Here we go. He talked for an hour, I didn't understand a word. <laughs> All I know is by the end of it, he's going, that's my theory, Dave, it should work. I need to get a computer onto this. I've not written it down, it's in my head, let's do it now. I tell you what, I tell you what, the office isn't far away, I've got a car outside, we can break in. Come on, let's go. We jump in his car, we drive to the offices of the American Physical Society, we get in through means unknown, he starts trying to find himself a Google Whack. I have no idea what his theory was. All I know is that to begin with, I was far from impressed. He starts putting in random pairs of words. Seismic pedestrian, 13,800 hits. Oscilloscope pedestrian, 287 hits. Oscilloscope pedestrian, I've naught. Too far. <laughs> Laser pedestrian, 14,800 hits. Laser pedestrian, I've Oh, yes, he complimentary, didn't he? Of course he did. Physicist, clever chap, absolutely. And there it is for you there, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and you'd think he'd be happy with that, but he wasn't. No, no. He thought, no, I want to make this work better. That theory took too long. It's not a good theory. He took his theory apart. He put his theory back together again. He gave it another go. Two goes it took him. Two goes, and he landed straight at coelacanth sharpener. <laughs> oh, he was delighted with that. He really was. Coelacanth sharpener led to a website called wallytown.com. On wallytown.com, there was an email address blinking away for a man called Warren. He said, come on, let's tell Warren that he's a Google Wack. So we did. But we didn't send him a cryptic email saying, hello, Warren, did you know that you are a Google Wack? We sent him an email that explained everything. We told him who we were, we told him what we were doing, we told him what Google Wacking was, and we told him what the two words were, Coelacanth and Sharna. He'd think everything was there. But somehow, I, I, I understand, we, we weren't very good. We, we weren't very good at explaining it. I know we weren't clear to him because he didn't understand our explanation. I know that because he wrote back to me saying, what on earth were you actually looking for? <laughs> What on God's green earth made you put coelacanth sharpener into a search engine? <laughs> and we wrote back saying we weren't looking for a coelacanth sharpener, were we? <laughs> we were looking for a Google Whack. It's a game that people play, that's all it is. He went, oh, I see, right, it's a game, I understand now, right, well, fine. Right, what did you say, right? In which case, why are you playing that game? And I wrote back to him saying, well, my name's Dave, I live in London, turns out I'm a Google Whack. Right now, I've accidentally ended up in Washington, but I've bumped into David, he's also a Google Whack. Because we're both Google Whacks, it's kind of come up in conversation, and now he's trying to find one. And he wrote back to me saying, so why are you in Washington? And I wrote back saying, well, there's this man in France. And <laughs> basically, six or seven emails later, I've explained everything to him. I mean, literally, everything you've had this evening that is pertinent to this story, he got in these emails. But again, I don't think I was clear. In fact, again, I know I wasn't, because this time he wrote back saying, OK, right, fine, I've got this, fine, my name's Warren, I live in Boston, I'm having a party tomorrow, you can stay over if you like. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm trying to do at all, no. And I'm turning to David, I go, what am I supposed to do? This is a complete stranger that I've met on the internet. He's invited me to go to his house and stay over for the night for a party. I'm sure my mum told me not to do that kind of thing. <laughs> and David said, I think you should go. What do you mean you think I should go? He said, think about it. You don't like Washington. You're right not to. It's a horrible place. Boston, on the other hand, is fantastic. You'll have a great time in Boston. It's a wonderful city. Hey, I tell you what, in this day and age, I'll bet you can get a flight from Washington to Boston for less money than it costs you to spend the night in a Washington hotel. You'll save money by making that flight. He's offering to put you up, and when you get there, party! Yeah? <laughs> Everyone likes a party. He's right, I do. How does he know these things about me? <laughs> and we looked it up, and it was. It was cheaper to fly from Washington to Boston than it was to stay a night in the hotel. That's better than a two-pence flight to France. <laughs> I'm earning on this journey. <laughs>
I flew to Boston. If you don't believe me, there's my boarding card, and there I am in Boston. Here's Warren, the man I met in Boston. Lovely, lovely fella. He came to pick me up at the airport because he lives quite far out. I got in his car. I'm thinking he is a bit older than I was expecting. <laughs> man, you, he's clearly going to be some kind of party animal, isn't he? Look at the evidence. He's invited a complete stranger to spend the night at his house for no reason and at no notice whatsoever. He's clearly up for anything. Either that or I'm about to lose a kidney. Anyway, <laughs> we're in the car, we're driving along, four foot snow drifts, you could lose a body. I'm getting scared. He's chatting away. He says to me, oh, Dave, you're going to love this party. We do this every year. First Saturday after Christmas. Uh, it's my girlfriend's family. Oh. Oh, there's tension in my belly there. <laughs> there's me in that car thinking, party! Oh, no, party, that's where I was going there. <laughs> that is a completely different kind of party. I've never been more English and refined and polite in all my life. Give me five glasses of wine, I'm dancing with Grandma. These are the most wonderful, welcoming, friendly souls I've ever encountered in all my days. I loved this party. I ended this party in the basement playing table tennis with a nine-year-old boy. That hasn't happened to me since I was nine. <laughs> I was loving it, playing a bit of ping pong. Warren's upstairs, he shouts down to me, Dave, I've got something important to show you. Can't come right now, Warren, I'm playing an important game of ping pong. This is more important, Dave, come up now. OK, OK, you're the winner. I ran upstairs into the study. What is it, Warren? What have you done? He said, I've done it. I've got you, you're too Google Wax. <laughs> I didn't ask you to find me any Google Wax. What on God's green earth makes you think that I am trying to meet Google Wax? He said the fact that you're in fucking Boston. <laughs> I said, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> but at least it makes sense. Go on then, what have you found? Show me your Google Maps. He was so thrilled with himself. He found Ammonite Googleplex, and there it is for you there. And Bamboozle Panfish. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there that one is for you there. And I said, well done, Warren. You're a very clever man there. Very beautiful Google Maps. They are very good. Now, please, don't ask me to email these two people. That leads to trouble. He said, it's too late. I've already emailed them. <laughs> what do you mean you've already emailed them? He said, I had to call you upstairs quickly. One of them's about to ring. <laughs> What do you mean one of them's about to ring? And then the phone started ringing. He went, there you go, Dave, that's for you. <laughs> I said, well, who the hell is it? I said, well, who the hell is it? He said, it's Ammonite Google. I said, what the hell's his name? He said, it's Jerry. I went, right, fine. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Is that Jerry? He went, yeah. All right. He said, Is that Dave? I said, yeah. He went, so Dave. Do you want to come and meet me then? <laughs> wanted to meet all the others. <laughs> no, I didn't, Jerry. I have met all the others. It's not the same thing I didn't want to. I just have. Don't you understand? He said, well, why don't you want to come and meet me? Then I'm saying, Jerry, I don't even know where you live. He said, I live in Columbus. I said, Jerry, I don't know where Columbus is. He said, it's in Ohio. I said, Jerry, I don't know where Ohio is because I don't. I'm turning to Warren in the office going, Warren, help me out here, please. Tell me where the hell is Columbus, Ohio? He went, well, seeing as you're asking, it's not, it's not a straight line, you know, it's not as the crow flies, but it, it's sort of, sort of, on your way back to Washington. <laughs> is, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it really? He went, yeah, yeah, I, I looked up some flights in case you're interested. Right, fine, OK, I'll do it. OK, hello, Jerry. Yes, I'll see you tomorrow. OK, bye. <laughs> Three reasons for saying yes. Number one, it was easier. 
<laughs> Number two, my international fridge magnet collection was coming on in leaps and bounds. <laughs> Number three, I thought it would be fun. I flew to Columbus the next day, if you don't believe me. There's my boarding card, and there's Jerry, the man I met in Columbus. Lovely man, Jerry. Fantastic. He, I said to him straight away, Jerry, I don't want to talk about Google Whacking. That has got out of control. He said, fine. He took me to an alternative music night. That's his bag. We both got a bit squiffy. He went home. I went to a hotel. That was the end of that. In the morning, I get up, taxi from the hotel to the airport. I fly from Columbus back into Washington, where I've got a four-hour layover before my flight back to England. Four hours of thinking time there. Four hours of thinking time in which I found myself thinking, my life, that was a strange new year, wasn't it? <laughs> I've done some travelling this year already, haven't I? Of course, it's only a week old. What I've done there is 8,236 miles. What I've done there is I've travelled from... Shit, OK, I'll explain. Uh, I've made a bit of a mistake here. I got this map off the internet, and I've been using it for a while, and I've never liked it. I, I was doing it in a hurry when I got it, and it's a bit sort of squashed and distorted and not quite what the world really looks like. You know what I mean? And every time I put it on the screen, I think, oh, God, now there's another few hundred people think that's what I think the world looks like. <laughs> and especially because we're recording this one, I thought, well, I'm going to get it right for tonight, so I changed it earlier on today. But I've obviously forgotten to actually delete this slide, so my apologies, my mistake. This is more what we had at school, obviously. That's more like it. Now, what's happened there? <laughs> what's happened there? is I've travelled... I've travelled... Albeit this bit in the year before, out to the south of France, then New Year's Day, off I go to Washington, Washington to Boston, Boston to Columbus, and Columbus back into Washington again. In doing that, I've met several Google Whacks. Dork Turnspit came to meet me. He found unconstructive super egos. He found Dauphin Gormandise and Unicyclist Periscopes. He found Laser Pedestrian Eyes and Coelacanth Sharpener. He found Ammonite Googleplex and Bamboozle Panfish, and I've now met Ammonite Googleplex as well. Five in a row. <laughs> Halfway. <laughs> Halfway, and I haven't even tried. Imagine being that good at something that you're not trying to do. In my experience, when I try to do things, I normally get a bit better at them. Oh, I could have finished this in a week, couldn't I? I've got halfway. It's only taken me about a week to do that much. If I try, it's going to be easier. Halfway, yeah, I'll do that. Hey, money in the bank. Jay doesn't need to know what I'm spending it on, does he? I can write that novel when I come back. That's all right. Yeah. Hey, imagine going to France and telling David Gorman I'd actually bloody done it. Hey, that'd be a laugh, wouldn't it? Hey, imagine the look at it. But then again, then again, imagine telling him I'd only got five in a row. He wouldn't believe me that I'd done it by accident, would he? He wouldn't believe me that this was a mistake. He'd think I was doing it on purpose. If you're trying, halfway is just another word for failure. <laughs> That's how I felt all of a sudden. I didn't know I was playing the game. I feel like I'm losing the game. Oh, I'm jet-lagged to buggery. I haven't slept for a week. A little devil popped up on my shoulder going, go on. <laughs> Give it a go. <laughs> a little angel popped up on my other shoulder. Going, yeah, go on. <laughs> Give it a go. And I thought, I will do. I bloody will do. I will. I went to a payphone there and then in the airport. I rang Jerry back in Columbus. Jerry, it's Dave from last night. I know it's going to sound a bit strange. I need you to do me a favour. I need you to find me two Google Whacks. He said, that is strange. I got in late last night. I was a bit drunk. I found three. <laughs> I said, well done, Jerry. Drunk is clearly a good tactic. Just give me the first two, will you? He said, I don't know what they are, Dave. They're on the computer. They're in the archive. I need to go and look it up. I haven't got time for this, Jerry. And my flight leaves in 20 minutes. I'm meant to be sitting in that chair right now. Email them to me. I'll get them when I get home. I ran. I got my flight. I flew from Washington to London. I got in. I checked my email. Jerry had done his job. He'd found me his two Google Whacks. The first one of his that I looked up, Jeremiah's Conifer. This one led to an organization called IntegrityUSA.org, a witness of God's inclusive love to the Episcopal Church and the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community, based in Washington, D.C. <laughs> this is a measure of how committed I was to this idea now. I didn't want to go to Washington, did I? But I was prepared to if that's where number six is hiding, because I know you can't get to ten without going through six. That's how numbers work. So I sat down and I wrote them an email. All I know is that the, my email to these people bounced straight back to me with an error message saying it was no longer a working address. I had no other way of getting in touch with them. It was a dead end. OK, well, I've got another one, haven't I? I suppose that's why you find two, so you've got an alternative. What's the other one that Jerry had found? He'd also found alligator peristyles. This one, a collection of essays about someone's travels in India. But it doesn't say whose essays. It doesn't say where they live. They could be anyone. They could be American, English, they could be Australian, they could be Indian, for all I know. There are no clues on this website. I was infuriated. I got five in a row without lifting a finger. The moment I actually physically tried to make this happen for myself, I get two dead ends. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. 
No, you get in my way, I get even more determined to go through you. That's my nature. I thought, I know. I'll have a look at the loose ends, I'll have a look at laser pedestrianised, I'll have a look at the bamboozled panfish. If I can get one of them to come good for me, I'm going round the obstacle, aren't I? Bamboozled panfish, five in a row, and I'm going round the obstacle. Let's see what I can do. I looked up every single one of these. Every single one of these turned out to be a dead end for one reason or another, apart from rare bit nutters. That one turned out to be a bunch of mini drivers in Wales. <laughs> In particular, in Llandullet, in North Wales, 235 miles from home. Now, they didn't actually write back to my email saying, yes, do come and meet us. They didn't have to, though, because their website told me where they were. They have public meetings. I am a member of the public. I can attend a public meeting. I've got a car. It's not a mini, but it'll do. I got in that car. I made that drive. I'm very glad I did, because in Llandullet, I met Kelvin, who's one of the rare bit nutters. From there, I travelled all the way to Columbus, Ohio, again, where I met Ken Fussigen, also known as Bush Ranger Doublespeak. From there, I travelled on to Seattle, where I met Tom and Lisa, also known as Hippocampi Wallpaper. From there, all the way back to London, where I met Tritomella, also known as Bibliophilic Sandwich. And from there, all the way to San Diego, Dwayne T. Gish, also known as Dripstone Ningles. From there, all the way to Holland, Nina Adams, also known as Veranda's Plectrums. And from there, all the way back to LA, where I met Wendy Mogul, also known as Psychosomatic Rambunctiousness. From there, all the way to Austin, Texas, Byron Reese, also known as Pomegranate Filibusters, and I'll wager that that is the most expensive 20 seconds of a one-man show you've ever fucking seen. <laughs> what I've done there, what I've done there is an awful lot of travelling. What I've done there in little under two weeks is 29,408 miles. In doing all that travelling, I've met several Google Maps. Eight of them you might have been counting. You might well be sitting in your chairs now thinking, come on, Dave, eight in a row, you're nearly there, two more, come on. And you would be wrong to think that. Because, yes, I'd met eight, but no, they weren't all connected to each other in one long line. They were two different chains. In Wales, I met the rare bit nutters. They found me two Google Maps, both of whom agreed to meet me. I followed both of those chains. One chain went to four in a row, one chain went to five in a row, and there they both died. The four in a row died with dripstone ningles in the top corner for you there. A man called Dwayne T. Gish, there he is for you there. 81 years of age, Dwayne T. Gish. He didn't actually write back to me. His secretary did, saying, Dr. Gish will be happy to meet you. On that basis alone, I got on a plane, I flew all the way from London to San Diego, got a tram from San Diego out to the suburb of Santee, where Dr. Gish came to pick me up in his car and take me back to the office. Here I am with Dr. Gish inside that office, here I am outside the office, the Institute for Creation Research. <laughs> Creationism, quite a well-known point of view in America, not very well-known in this country, I find, so I feel the need to explain it for anyone who might not have heard of it. Creationists believe that evolution does not happen, has never happened, and is never going to happen. They believe that everything on this earth, us, animals, plants, were all created by a supreme being that may or may not be God. They believe, most of them, that the Bible is a literal text. They therefore believe that every single one of us is a descendant of Adam and Eve, none of us have evolved from monkeys. Most of them believe that the world is only 6,000 years old, not billions of years old, as those pesky scientists would have us believe, <laughs> with their evidence. <laughs> Now, I happen to believe that this is a load of nonsense. I believe it is dogmatic, wrong-headed poppycock. I think it is cock of the poppiest variety. <laughs> but that's OK, I don't mind. You can believe in any old kind of poppycock you want to, so long as you're nice to each other, that's all I care about. All I wanted was for this man to find me some Google Wax. Sadly, his secretary had neglected to pass on the Google-whacking nature of my inquiry. As far as Dr Gish was concerned, I was there to learn more about creationism. He's 81 years of age. He's never met anyone, I don't think, who didn't want to know more about it. So I think, well, fine, I'll go along with it. I can't dissuade him of his years, can I? Fine, I'll go along. I'll be a good student. I'll nod. I'll, hmm, I'll agree. I'll go with it. And when he thinks I'm his friend, then I'll skillfully segue the conversation into Google hacking. We both go away from the encounter with what we wanted. No harm done. So I let him talk. He is brilliant. He's witty and warm and wise and friendly and welcoming and knowledgeable and educated and erudite and almost always wrong. <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> He's written loads of books. He, he gave me a few books to take away. I wish I could talk to you for hours about any of these. They're all aimed at different markets. They all say basically the same thing. This one's my favourite, this one. It's actually not really a book, it's a pamphlet. I suppose that's why it's my favourite. There's less of it, really. <laughs> it's aimed at students, high school and university students. It's actually a cartoon. Not only did he write this cartoon, he stars in this cartoon. <laughs> How beautiful is this? And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker of the evening, Dr. Dwayne T. Gish. And there he is again and again and again in all these pictures. Does anything strike you as odd about these pictures? Can I remind you that this is what he looks like? <laughs> he appears to have cast Ben Affleck as himself in this cartoon. <laughs> This is preposterous, but I like him because he's preposterous. Preposterous people are very good company as far as I'm concerned. I was having a wonderful time with this man. 
But the truth is, I did grow to dislike him, and I think that, that's an interesting thing for the story. He is the only person in this story that I genuinely ended up, can't, I, I can't say that I liked. And I should explain the reasons. I didn't dislike him because he's a creationist. In fact, somebody else that I met on this journey is also a creationist, and we got on like a house on fire. It isn't that. I'll explain. He was trying to explain creationism to me, and he suddenly quoted the second law of thermodynamics. Now, for an odd reason involving a deceased musical double act and a great physics teacher, I happen to know the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> and Dr. Gish didn't say all of it. He only said a part of it. And then he said that the second law of thermodynamics means that evolution is not possible. And that's not true. And I think with his qualifications, he's got a very good degree in biochemistry from a very good university in the States, he knows his science, he's a real scientist. I think that's wrong of him to only quote part of the law and use it to say something which I don't believe is true. And I'd like to tell you that this is the reason I didn't like this man, because I believe that to be a good reason for not liking that man. But the truth, ladies and gentlemen, the real reason I didn't like that man, that man, <laughs> is because he didn't find me any sodding Google wax. He couldn't do it. It was not possible. I tried to explain it to him. I really did. But he's an 81-year-old man. I don't think he really knows what the internet is. I couldn't persuade him to come with me to the computer. I was down, but I wasn't out. I still had the other chain on the go, the one that sadly did end a few days later with Byron there in Austin, Texas, chomping on his cigar. Lovely man Byron, he didn't let me down. He found me two Google Wax, all right? Absolutely. It's just that the two Google Wax he found me turned out to be dead ends, as did so many of the others that had been found for me along the way. And that means it's all over. There's nothing on that screen. There's no hope. There's nothing. It's just dead ends and people I've already met. I was heartbroken. I was down. I, I had a bit of a personal crisis in Austin, Texas. I found myself in that hotel room looking into the mirror thinking, do you know what? That beard is a lie. <laughs> you grew that beard in order to announce to the world that you were writing a novel. You grew that beard in order to announce to the world that you were leaving these childish, idiotic quests behind you. Have you written one word of that novel? No, you sodding haven't. Have you left these childish quests behind you? Evidently not. You find yourself in Austin, Texas, having failed to find any Google Maps. You're an idiot. You're a child. You are clearly genetically programmed to live some kind of childish, idiotic life. <laughs> Fine. Go ahead and live that life, but live it honestly. Remove that beard. Ring Jake. Tell him you're not writing that novel. Stop lying to yourself and to the rest of the world about who you are and what you could be. I went into town to get a disposable razor, came back to the hotel and got ready to shave this beard off. I couldn't quite do it. If you've ever had a full beard, you'll understand what I'm saying. You can't just shave one off. You've got to leave patterns and shapes. <laughs> You can't do them all, though, can you? You do one, you've ruined another, they contradict, they overlap. I had pen and paper out, I was drawing faces, filling in beards. I was going mental, is what I was doing. Too many ideas bouncing around inside one tiny cranium. Stop it! You're going mad! Part one, you are upset. You tried to do something, meet ten Google Wax in a row, you failed to do it, and now you're upset. Fine, go out, get drunk, drown your sorrows, deal with it like a man. Dealt with. <laughs> Part two, in your upset, you've discovered that this is a lie. You're not who you want to be. Fine. Ring Jake, remove the beard, deal with all of that, but do it tomorrow when you're no longer upset. Go and get the drink, go and get that out of your head, deal with it. Into town I go. Austin, Texas, bit of a party town. Sixth Street, Austin, the party street. Every building on that street appears to be a bar, as far as I can tell. I walk up to the first bar, bounce the steps in my way. Where do you think you're going? Just come in for a quiet drink. Where's your picture ID? I don't carry picture ID. I'm British. We don't really need it at home. Why do I need picture ID? You might not be 21. <laughs> look at me. Look at my grizzled, gnarled beard. It's 31-year-old face. Use your common sense. I haven't got any common sense. Of course you haven't. You're a bouncer and you're American. Right, fine. Cool. <laughs> I tried every single bar on that street. Not one of them would let me come in without picture ID. I was going mad. And then I realised, I have got some ID, haven't I? Back at my hotel, I've got my passport, haven't I? That's official ID, that'll do the job. Back to the hotel I go, get the passport and come out to get drunk. You probably know me well enough by now, ladies and gentlemen, to work out for yourselves that it's not necessarily wise for me to get drunk while in possession of my passport. <laughs> If I get drunk in possession of my passport, I don't always know which hemisphere I'm going to wake up. <laughs> Imagine the joy in my heart when I woke up the next morning in Austin, Texas, in my own hotel room and everything. Oh, I was delighted. I skipped out of bed. I thought, oh, that's a very strange hangover you've got this morning. <laughs> my head is OK. My stomach. Well, it's turning, but it's not the fast cycle. <laughs> That's OK. Most of this hangover appears to be in my arm. <laughs> I've never had a hangover in my arm before. 
I need to investigate that, don't I? I went through to the bathroom, I looked in the mirror, and this is what I saw, this is what I saw, this is what I saw, this is what I saw. <laughs> what the fuck have I done to myself now? What the fuck have I done to myself now? Don't fucking applaud me for ruining my own life! What the fuck have I done now? Oh, you can imagine me on Sixth Street now, can't you? I've got my ID now, haven't I? I've got my driver's license now. What the fuck have I done to my... Who the fuck is that? That's what I look like there. Not that there, not that. That isn't even my fucking birthday. <laughs> that is my birthday if you're American, which I'm not. To my English eyes, that says the 3rd of fucking February. I'm the 2nd of fucking March. <laughs> I've got the wrong birthday and a freak's face on my arm for the rest of my fucking life. <laughs> well, there's no need getting a fucking fridge magnet from Austin, Texas now, is there? <laughs> I think you'll find I've got a souvenir that'll be for quite some time from that journey. If you've got that on your arm, and I have, you can hardly shave that off your face, can you? <laughs> At least he's got a red beard. It might be meant to be me. <laughs> if I shave this off, who the fuck's that then? <laughs> this was done to me by a man called Boo Boo. <laughs> I only know that because I found this receipt in my wallet. <laughs> A fucking receipt. Imagine being so drunk you would do that to yourself, but so self-employed you would ask for a fucking receipt. <laughs> what was I going to do? Take it back? <laughs> I've ruined my life. I've trapped myself in my beard for the rest of my life. I can't ring Jacob now and tell him I'm not this man. I've got to be this man for the rest of my life. I couldn't go back home. I couldn't go home and say to my friends, this is what I've done with the month of January. <laughs> I couldn't go home and tell people what I'd done because that would involve telling me what I'd done and I couldn't really face what I'd done to my own life. I didn't know what to do. And then I suddenly realised I've got one friend in America, one friend in America who doesn't know my friends back here. I can ring her. So I did. I rang Julie. Julie's a wonderful friend of mine. I've known her for years. She lives in LA. I rang Julie saying, Julie, I don't know what to do. I'm out of my depth. It's all gone wrong. Julie, life's just turned to shit. And Julie's going, Dave, this isn't you. You don't normally sound like this. Please, get on a plane and come to Los Angeles and stay with me until you're you again. And I did. I flew all the way to LA and I stayed with Julie and she looked after me like the angel that she is. And she kept saying to me, Dave, what? is wrong. And I couldn't tell her about that. <laughs> I couldn't tell anyone about that for weeks on end. For weeks on end, that was between me and Boo Boo. <laughs> All I could tell her about was the Google whacking still there inside, eating me up and saying, Julie, I can't start it again and I don't know what I'm doing, Julie. I got a four in a row and a five in a row and all of these were dead ends and I don't know what to do next. Before that, I got a five in a row and all of these are dead ends as well, Julie. I don't know what I'm doing. And Julie said to me, Dave, this does not make sense. You're telling me that everyone is allowed to find you two Google Wax. Well, I can see. He found you two, and he found you two, and he found you two, and he found you two. So why is that one only supposed to find you one? <laughs> and she's right. I'm back in the fucking saddle. This game is still alive. And if the game is still alive, I can still be the winner. And if I can be the winner, I might be able to claw some dignity out of this situation. And right now, there's precious little of that knocking around. I got straight on Julie's computer. I emailed Marcus in Birmingham, the woman and dog man. Marcus, please, 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 you owe me one more thing. One more Google back, please, as soon as you can. And God love that man. He came back within 24 hours with a beauty. How could you not love the man who is capable of finding hydroids all lacking? <laughs> oh, yes. And here it is for you there, the Antarctic Journal. <laughs> the Antarctic Sodding Journal of Dr. M. Dale Stokes. My last thread of hope keeping this game alive is the Antarctic Journal. <laughs> oh, Doctor, I had no idea if it was possible for a regular Joe like me to just go to the Antarctic. I didn't have any choice, though, did I? He's my last hope. 
If I meet him, it's alive. If I don't, it's dead. I emailed Dr. Emdahl Stokes and said, Dr. Emdahl Stokes, please, this is my story. Now that you know my story, please tell me I'm allowed to come and meet you. But please, if you tell me I'm allowed to come and meet you, you're going to have to tell me how I go about coming to meet you. <laughs> and God love this man. He wrote back again within 24 hours saying, fine, you are allowed to come and meet me. This is how you do it. And I did it. I travelled all the way from L.A., where I was staying with Julie, all the way to San Diego, where he now lives and works at the university. There he is. He's a wonderful man. I went by train as it goes. Lovely fella. Sat me down, made me a drink. Said, so, Dave, you enjoying San Diego? I said, I am, Dale. It's a lovely town. He said, you've been here before, Dave? I said, you know what? I said, about a week ago. He went, no, really? What were you doing? I said, I was meeting another Google whack. No, really? What was he like? A bit weird, to be honest. He was an 81-year-old creationist. No, really? God, I expect he was one of Dr. Gish's lot. <laughs> He wears a wig, really fantastic! <laughs> Dale got so excited, he hates Dr. Kish. Oh, when I was a student, I wanted to go and trash that man's museum. He's a nasty piece of work. We ran to Dale's office, in his office, in a filing cabinet, for reasons I don't quite understand. He's kept every essay he's ever written in his academic career. He's now a doctor. He went into this cabinet, he came out with it two minutes later. An essay he'd written 15 years earlier. This essay here, Analysis of a Creationist Pamphlet and Evidence for Evolution by Dale Stokes, Third Year Biology Homework. I started reading that essay. Which pamphlet do you think he was analysing? Only that sort of pamphlet there. <laughs> I start reading Dale's analysis of it and I see the following sentence. Dr Gish's twisted definition of the second law of thermodynamics. Oh! We're soulmates now, me and Dale. Oh, united. United by a common enemy now, me and Dale. Absolutely, we both hate Dr Gish. He hates him for his creationist views, I hate him for his failure to Google back, but we both hate him all the same. <laughs> and I'm explaining to them, I think this is amazing. You and Dr. Gish are the two most diametrically opposed human beings I've ever encountered on, my, on this planet. This is amazing. You are his opposite. You are his nemesis. I've never met a man's nemesis before. <laughs> oh, you're hot, he's cold, you're black, he's white, you're Batman, he is the Joker. This is remarkable. Hey, I'll tell you something else about Dr. Gish. He could not Google whack. Can you? You've never seen a more motivated Google Whacker in all your life! I tell you, 30 seconds, two Google Whacks popped up like toast. It was remarkable. He's a lovely, lovely man. He is Hydroid Zuvlaki. He found me too. One of the two that he found me, Ace High Lawnmowers. That took me all the way to Memphis, where I met Ernie McCracken. Ernie McCracken found me, Grandmaster Sticklebacks, taking me all the way to London, where I met Peter Rowlands. Peter Rowlands found me, after these scriveners, taking me all the way back to Seattle, where I met Chris and John. Chris and John found me, Baptized Slurry, taking me all the way to Dorset, where I met John Palmer. John Palmer found me, Yo Yo Trip Tip, taking me all the way. <laughs> to China. <laughs> Where I met Robert Burnell, who found me Langer's Nasturtium and Langer Dandelions. That is a very good one. That is seven in a row and two potential number eight. Two potential number eights leads to four potential number nines, leads to eight potential number tens. Surely I've got a good chance of winning with eight potential number tens. But to have all of that potential, I need the two number eights to come good first. I wanted them both. I looked them both up with a fire in my belly. Langer's Nasturtium went through to a woman called Kathy Burkholder. She wrote back to me saying, fine, but I wanted them both. I looked up the other one, Langer Dandelions, led to a website about a TV show. A TV show called The Living Edens, Bhutan, Land of the Thunder Dragon, made for the PBS network in America. Who's responsible for this Google Back existing? Well, written and produced by a man called Harry Marshall. I'll give him the credit. Can I find his contact details? Not really, kind of. I can find the contact details for the company he must work for. The show is produced by Davilio Donegan Enterprises, 4401 Connect Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C. Now, I've gone back to London, because if you stay in China for long enough, they make you. And now, <laughs> I'm looking to fly from London to L.A. to meet Cathy. Flying from London to L.A. involves flying over Washington, D.C. If instead of flying over it, I land in it, do one short journey, have half a day in Washington, go to that address. If he's there, I meet him. If he's not, I might be able to track him down. If I can, I've got him. And then I fly to LA, where I know I'll meet Kathy. If I can't find him, I'm still going to go to LA and meet Kathy. Half a day's difference to find out if it's two or one number eight. Seemed to me to be a risk worth taking. It's certainly a risk I took. If you don't believe me, there I am. 4401 Kennedy Avenue Northwest, where the secretary told me that Harry Marshall now lives in Bristol. <laughs>
So, off I go to LA. Don't believe me, there I am in LA. There's Kathy Burkholder. She found me pie and supper cuts. That took me all the way to Chicago. There I am in Chicago. There's John F. Cougine. That put me within spitting distance of victory. I needed to meet one of the two that John found me. I thought it was just simple. Number 10 should be the easiest one to meet. Number 10, numbers 1 through 9, you don't just have to meet them, you have to persuade them to Google that, so they have to want to meet you. Number 10, you don't have to do anything other than meet them. It's over the minute you shake their hand. Even if they write back to me saying, no, I don't want to meet you, please don't come and meet me, if I know where they live... <laughs> all I've got to do is go to their front door, ring the doorbell, shake their hand and run away into the bushes declaring myself the winner, that's OK! I thought, I'm home and dry. John found me too, I thought it's bound to come good, surely. I got all the way to the brink of victory, only to meet defeat. But there. <laughs> on the bench in Bristol, Harry Marshall, Langdor Dandelions, that's where I'm heading next. There I am in Bristol. There is Harry Marshall. He found me Spence Lift Glaswegians. That took me all the way to Edinburgh. There I am in Edinburgh. There's Eric Laurier. Once again, the brink of victory. And Eric really understood exactly how important this was. He said to me, Dave, am I right? You need to meet one of the two Google Whites that I find? I said, yes. He said, and you need to do this before your 32nd birthday? I said, yes. He said, when is your 32nd birthday? I said, not the 3rd of fucking February. <laughs> it's the 2nd of March. <laughs> In which case, Dave, I suggest that you're wasting my time. February is nearly over. March is nearly upon us. Why don't you get in your car and start driving down to London and stop wasting my time? Yes, I'm going to go and Google whack for you, but I want you to be in the best hub for international transport when I find these whacks. Now, go on, get going. So I did. I got in the car and started driving down the country. Halfway down the country, my mobile phone rang. I looked at the screen. I knew it was Eric. I pulled over and took that call. I had to. It was an emergency. Eric, it's Dave. Please tell me you've got the Google Wacks. Of course I have. Have you got a pen? Of course I have. Give me the Google Wacks. What have you got? It found two absolute pearls. How could you not be happy? Spatula de Newmont and try Moran's crimps. I looked them both up. The first one I looked up, Spatula de Newmont, because I thought it'd be a lovely Newmont to my story. And it would have been as well, had it not been a Japanese page with no contact details on it whatsoever. It was useless. It was doing nothing except ruining the lives of a fucking Google Wackers. That's all. That was, it was a dead end. But that one... Oh, that one filled my heart with joy. Trimaran scripts led me to the Marine Store Chandlery in Malden in Essex, a 41-mile drive from home, after everything I'd put myself through. In January and February of 2003, I travelled 71,014 miles. In the first eight weeks of 2003, I spent more than one week in a plane. <laughs> In the first eight weeks of 2003, my average speed was over 50 miles an hour. <laughs> and now... And now, all I needed to do, all I needed was a 41-mile drive into Essex. I've never been happier about making that drive in all my life. Here I am, outside the Marine Store Chandlery in Malden, in Essex, about to walk through that door, shake the hand of whoever worked there that day and declare myself the winner. I was pumped up, I was excited. I had a couple of days to spare. I was actually going to win with a couple of days to spare. I couldn't believe it. I wanted to share my excitement. I got my mobile phone. I thought, I'll ring the man who gave this to me, the last man to ring me. I'll ring Eric Laurier in Edinburgh. Eric, it's Dave. I love you for this. I'm about to meet number 10 and it's all down to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you ever need anything from me, I'll be there in a heartbeat for you. Eric, you've got a friend for life. I love you for this. Thank you. Thank you so much. He's going, this is amazing, Dave. What is it? Which one is it? Which one's number 10? I said, it's trimorans and crimps. And he said, oh. <laughs> That's not what I said. confetti. What do you mean it's not a Google Wack? It is a Google Wack. It must be what you said. He said, Dave, I'm being honest. I didn't say Trimoran's crimps. I said Trimoran scrimps. <laughs> <laughs> and he had. It was a sodding Google Wack. Hey, you got geos and it's .com. I wish I was a minnow. <laughs> Well, you don't need many clues from me to work out what country that's in, do you? <laughs>
It's in Australia, isn't it? Obviously enough is the website for you there. So, what's this site all about? Well, it's my chance to really work out who I am. Do I want to be A, a straight man with a steady girlfriend, B, a shy voyeur on the fringes of the gay club scene, or C, a minnow? <laughs> it's a tricky little conundrum in this modern day and age, isn't it? His girlfriend knows nothing about this, but once every couple of months he goes out cruising on the gay club scene. His gay friends know nothing about his straight life, his straight friends know nothing about his gay life, he keeps the two entirely separate. It is only here, here in his website, that he is honest with the world. He's anonymous, but he says to the world, this is the man that I am. This is the life that I lead. Please, tell me what you think of me. And to help you tell him what you think of him, he provides an email address at the foot of the page. You can see it there and even more clearly there. I had an email address that I knew worked, a website that I knew was current, and a city I could point to on an atlas. I still had time to get there. I could still do this. I sat down, I wrote that man an email. But as I wrote that man an email, I knew one thing above all others. I did not have time to wait for his reply. Travelling from London to Sydney takes a day. I didn't have a day to spare in my schedule. If I waited a day and he wrote back to me saying, yes, I'd love you to come and meet me, I still couldn't get there until March the 2nd. On March the 2nd, I will be 32. That's too late. The challenge was to do this before I was 32. March the 1st is the deadline while well, I'm still 31. That's the only chance I've got. And the only chance I've got to get in there is to fly blind, not knowing if he will agree to meet me or not. I've got no choice. It's a no-brainer. If I wait, I've lost. If I go now, I have a chance. Into my car, I get to the airport. In Heathrow Airport, in a little internet kiosk, I book myself into a cheap little hotel in Sydney, committing myself to the task. Then I surf into my bank account. See the amount of money I've got left. I know exactly what the contract said. I knew I hadn't written one word of this novel. I know how much money Jake had given me. I know what the deadlines mean. I know that I now owe Jake every single penny of this money back. Legally, morally, contractually, completely and utterly correctly and without complaint, I now owe Jake all of this money back. But I found myself in that airport staring at that bank account, seeing the small amount of money propping me up in life that day, and I found myself in that airport thinking, fuck it! <laughs> I am Thelma and Louise driving off that cliff! I I am Butch and Sundance going out all guns blazing. I am David James fucking Gorman. And I am going business class. And that's what I did. I flew all the way, all the way, all the way from London to Sydney. And there I go. And there I sodding land. And if you don't believe me, here are my boarding cars, as you can see. I landed in Sydney, Australia at 10.30 p.m. on the 28th of February. 25 and a half hours left with which I had to meet my man. 25 and a half hours left. The first thing I did, taxi to the hotel. Hotel, where's the nearest internet cafe? They told me around the corner, around the corner I went. Into that internet cafe, I'm looking through my inbox, I'm looking for his name. It's the only thing that matters to me. He's had a whole day to write to me while I've been travelling. Had he written to me? No. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm in Sydney. I'm writing him another email, aren't I? I'm in Sydney. I've travelled halfway around the world. I've travelled here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to meet you. I need to meet you, please. I need one minute of your life. Less than that, I need a half a minute. I need a handshake from you, that's all. Please, tell me where you are and I will travel to you. I've travelled 10,000 miles today. Of course, I'll do some more, please. This means my world. This is it. I've put my entire life in this game. I need this to work. If I lose this game, I've thrown my life away, please. This means the world to me. That's why I've travelled half of it. I need this to happen. Please, it has to happen on March the 1st while I'm still 31. After that, I've lost this game. Please. This is my email address. This is my phone number at the hotel. Please, I beg of you. I will check them all through March the 1st. Please, get in touch. I need to know what's happening. Dave, send. Went back to the hotel. I slept a while. My body gave me little choice. I needed it. I woke up the next morning, refreshed, revived, eager, keen, straight into that internet cafe. I'm looking for his name in my inbox again. He's still not there. Still not there. Okay, maybe he's not up yet. Maybe he's going to ring me. He might ring me. I'll go back to the hotel. I wait for the phone to ring. Phone's not ringing. Phone's not ringing. Phone's not ringing. Okay, back into the internet cafe. Nothing. 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 Hotel. Nothing. 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 Cafe. Nothing. Hotel. Nothing. Cafe. Nothing. Hotel. Nothing. 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 Nothing, 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 nothing but fucking heartbreak all day long. And then finally, at about 6.30 p.m. in that internet cafe, I see his name in my inbox for the very first time. My heart leaps into my mouth. Every fibre of my body is desperate to read that email. Apart from the fibres that make up that finger, it refuses to click on the mouse. It doesn't want to open it. It doesn't want to be responsible for the rest of my life. And I have to force it, and bang, that email opens up and fills the screen in front of me. I was looking at two words. <laughs> no, sorry. 
Ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope you've enjoyed my Googlebuck adventure. Um, <laughs> if you have, please tell your friends, uh, and if you haven't, please tell your friends. I think word of mouth should always exist on everything you see live, and, and it should always be honest as well, so, so please do. I encourage you to do that. The, the only thing I ask of you regarding that, and this is a sincere request, is, is to please don't go and tell people what happens in the show. Tell people what you think of the show. If you went to see a movie, you wouldn't go and tell your friends who the murderer was. And I think almost more importantly, please, 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 don't tell people that this is there. <laughs> I hate this. I forget it's there, and then I wake up in the morning and I see it again, looking back at me in the mirror, and every single morning I swear I see his little lips go, you wanker. <laughs> Please, don't tell people that's there, because it only encourages them to talk about it, and I hate that. Now, there are always going to be some cynics in the world. There will always be some people who think this isn't a true story. There will always be some people who think, I did all of this in order to have this show. I also wrote a book about this, and recently somebody came up to me after a show and said, you clearly got paid by your publisher to do this. Let me explain to you how that book comes to exist. When I came home from this, and I had to go and confront my publishers, and I had to say to them, I'm sorry, I haven't written your novel, but I have spent all of your money. <laughs> Their lawyers got in touch with my lawyers, who incidentally didn't exist until some other lawyers wanted to talk to them. <laughs> to say, that's stealing. <laughs> we want a novel on Thursday or our money back. I, was going, I can't do that. I haven't got the money. I haven't written a novel. I can't. I don't know what to do. And my first suggestion was, look, I've been all over the world. I've traveled 90,000 miles around the world. I've met all these people. Maybe I could write that book instead. And they said, no, that's not a novel. <laughs> so I went to Australia. I started writing and performing this show. About two weeks after this story had ended, I was on stage in Australia telling people this story because I had to do something to get the money back. That's why this show exists. I didn't do all of this so that I could have this show. I do this show in order to rescue myself from the financial oblivion that all this left me. <laughs> I am blessed. I am the most fortunate man in the world. I did 150 shows, and in doing that, I paid back the publishers. As the last penny rolled into my publisher's account, the phone rang, and I said, Dave, thanks ever so much for the money. We really appreciate it. Very good of you. While you're on the phone, the non-fiction department have said they'd quite like a word. <laughs> Apparently, they think you might like to write a book about what you've done. I said, what a good idea! <laughs> that was the life raft floating before my eyes. I clung onto that for dear life. That's why that book and this show exist. That's how this came to happen. And there will, even though I've told you now, there will still be cynics in this room. If you're sitting there thinking that I made this up, let me say this. There are three possible reasons why this is on my arm. <laughs> Number one. It's a real tattoo that I had done in order to entertain strangers. How fucked is that? <laughs> Number two, it's a fake. Number three, I've told you a true story. I'm going to crouch down at the edge of this stage. I'm going to roll up my sleeve. You will have ten seconds, if you wish to, to rub, spit, scratch. <laughs> Do anything you see fit to verify for yourselves that I've told you a true story. If you're in the balconies, I suggest you start moving now. <laughs> if you're sitting in a chair thinking, I don't believe this is true, but I'm not going to be bothered to find out, fuck off! <laughs> and never come and see me in any theatre ever again. I do not want your cynicism in my room. <laughs> you should have the good grace to come and find out that you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> it's the only reason I put myself through this. If you believe me, you've got no reason to come. If you don't, it is entirely up to you to take the option. Your ten seconds. <laughs> oh, having a discussion about it, are we, on the third row? <laughs> are we, oh, how cynical are we today? Are we cynical enough to move eight yards? Is that what you're fucking doing? Is that what you're doing? Do you want to have a fucking time to look at it? Would you like to have a look at it? Have a fucking look at it, then. Go on, then. Have a look. Too lazy to do this. Your time starts now. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You cynical, 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 fuck them! Fuck off! Fuck off! Fuck off! It's real, isn't it? Isn't it? Now you three stand up, turn round, and tell that audience that you were wrong and I was right. We were wrong. <laughs> it's a fucking true story. If I was any good at making things up, I'd have written a fucking novel! <laughs> Please.
believe me when I tell you this was the worst day of my sodding life. <laughs> I, hey, I woke up the morning after this, it was my birthday, 10,000 miles from home, alone, broke, and a failure. I hated myself that morning. I wanted to smother myself in the cheap nylon pillows in that room. <laughs> But I couldn't because the phone started ringing and you can't kill yourself if the phone's ringing, it's not possible. Get what is it? It's reception, there's somebody downstairs to say, no, there isn't, you've rung the wrong room, I don't know anyone in Sydney, what are you talking about? She said, look, his name's Danny, he says happy birthday. It's my birthday. Why is he in, in, in Sydney? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't start, I said, send him upstairs, that's brilliant, thank you, thank you. I put the phone down, I ran and got dressed really hurriedly. There was a rat-a-tat-tat -tat at the door, I go to the door, there's a complete stranger standing there going, happy birthday! <laughs> thank you. You wouldn't by any chance wish you were a Minogue, would you? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, right, Danny isn't your real name, is it? He said, no, but Kylie rather gives it away. <laughs> Very good joke, your man, you better come in. Do you want a cup of tea? He said, yes. I said, right, I put the kettle on. I put the kettle on. I could not conceal my anger. Why didn't you come and see me yesterday? I needed to meet you yesterday. Yesterday I was 31, now I'm 32. Now you're rubbing salt in my wounds. Why couldn't you give me half a minute of your life yesterday? He said, I couldn't. Yesterday was Mardi Gras. <laughs> for those that don't know, Mardi Gras, one of the world's largest gay and lesbian pride marches. It happens in Sydney, Australia, and it's not just for the gay and lesbian community, it's for the world. 400,000 people flood the streets of Sydney that day. Mum and dad, grandma and granddad, kids in pushchairs, all celebrating sexuality in all its many flavours. And this man says to me, my girlfriend goes to that. And so I have to go with her. Because what sane man would not accompany the woman he loves to the biggest party in the city in which they live? And every year I go, and every year I stand on the side of the street thinking, this is it, this is the day that my two worlds collide, this is the day that my world ends. I see gay friends of mine in the parade and in the crowd, and I see straight friends of mine in the crowd, and I don't know who I am. I don't know who to be. How do I wear my hair, my collar, my jeans, how do I stand, how do I talk, how do I behave, which me do I be? All I know is that if my two worlds meet, my life is over. All I do that day is hold tight onto my girlfriend and steer her away from the people I do not want her to meet. And that includes you. You know about my website, she doesn't. I can't let the two of you breathe the same oxygen, let alone speak to each other. I know how much you needed it, I know how much you wanted it, I wanted to be able to give it to you and I couldn't. And I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. I had no idea when I wrote those emails that I was ever making anyone else's life more difficult. I apologise, I'm sorry. But why the fuck have you come to tell me that now? I don't need to know that now, do I? My life is ruined this morning, I've thrown it all away, and the last thing I need to be told is I made somebody else's life more difficult while fucking up my own. He said, fine. I came to say thank you, as it goes. My website says, tell me what you think of me. I need to know what other people think of me because I don't know what I think of me. And you ignored all that, didn't you? All you ever did was write to me saying, can you come and meet me to play your own stupid, boxy, sodding little game? I need to know what other people think. And then last night, from nowhere, you summoned up an opinion. You had the guts to tell me what you think. Not many do. I'm in town this morning. I thought I'm by myself. I'll go and say thank you. I know where he is. So here I am this morning, saying happy birthday, David Gorman, and thank you for having the guts for telling me exactly what you think of me. Because I had. <laughs> when I read, no, sorry. <laughs> I hit reply. <laughs> I said, right. Well, while I'm here, let me say I think you are being a complete and utter shit to your girlfriend. She's an adult, she's a grown-up, she's a human being who is entitled to make adult, grown-up choices about her own future as based on real information given to her by the people who claim to love her. You absolute fucking cunt! It's a bad word and I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't you dare applaud that word! <laughs> You demean me and you in applauding that word. I'm not proud of that word. It's not a funny word. It's not a clever word. I wouldn't normally use that word. But this is a true story, and that's the truth. That's the word that fell through my fingers into the keyboard in my rage that day. And he looked me in the eye in that hotel room and said, thank you for that. Thank you for your advice. I'm not going to take it. 
but I appreciate the honesty with which it is given. And I said, right. So what we are now is a pair of dickweeds in a hotel room in Sydney. <laughs> My life is screwed this morning. I've thrown it all away. And from where I'm sitting, yours is even fucking worse. He said, yeah, maybe it is, maybe you're right, maybe I'm out of my death, maybe you can't help me now, maybe nobody can. But maybe, just maybe, Mr. Gorman, maybe I can help you. Oh, can you really? Maybe I can, actually, yes. What time do you make it now? And it was about 9.30, he went, right. What time's that in England? <laughs> 10.30 yesterday. Which means it's 11.30 yesterday in France. Which means I'm picking up the telephone. Hello, David Gorman, how are you there? What time do you call this? What time do you call this? What time do you call this? He said, it's 11.30 at night, why? What night is it, Dave? Tell me that. He said, it's Friday night, why? No, Dave, what night of the year is it? Tell me that. He said, it's March the 1st, why? And I said, because that's the day before my 32nd birthday. I'm just ringing to let you know that I've met 10 Google Bugs in a row. I am the winner. <laughs> Bye! And we're staying with the Aussie theme next as we've everything from tiny cans of beans to Irish people having something hiding inside them. It's a long story. Dylan Moran provides the funny stuff in what it is after the break.